And now back, uh, a person who looks a lot like a person who spoke uh, yesterday morning, also happens to have the same name and uh, same credentials, uh, so I don't need to introduce him again. Uh, Mishko Heveri from Quick is going to give us a demonstration of, uh, of Quick. Um, so give it up for Mishko. Hello, hello, hello. Uh, let's click the magical record button. Okay, so hi, you already met me. Here we go. So I'm not going to introduce myself again, but I will start with a joke because I always start with a joke, and that is, why do functions break up? Or how do functions break up, rather? They stop calling each other. Now this joke is like, come on, no? Okay, no. <laughs> this joke is actually relevant for what we are about to talk about next. Um, all right, so I already told you yesterday about what's Builder. I already told you about our awesome team. So let's talk about what we really want to talk about, and that is that uh, most websites do not pass Core Web Vitals. What is Core Web Vitals? It is um, how Google basically looks at your website and says, you know, is this good enough? Because if you get a low score, that means that people uh, navigate to your website and they bounce. They come and they like give up and they leave, right? We have websites because we eventually want to get traffic onto them and people need to achieve something with these websites, whether it is to purchase something, to sign up for something, or find some information. And at the end of the day, they want to do something, right? And if your website is slow, it takes forever to load, then people leave. And Google knows this, and so Google will prioritize websites. If you have two websites that have equally good results on a search, but one is quicker, Google will uh, uh, give you the quicker one because, well, that's a better experience for the end users, uh, and that's what we want to do. So the interesting bit is that all websites, especially e-commerce websites that have real users on it, not a demo website, uh, get pretty bad ratings. Uh, as you can see, you know, I looked at Target, Wayfair, uh, Gap, Nike, they're all in the red. Amazon that is trying super hard is in the yellow. Why is this so hard to get right? And the answer to that is that there's just too much JavaScript. The amount of JavaScript that we've been creating and shipping to the client has just steadily been increasing. And this is uh, the thing that I would like to solve. And this is the thing that I've been kind of passionate about. And so uh, at Builder, we have a team, the Quick team, and we work on trying to figure out basically a new framework so that we can have, we can, as a developers, you can write all the necessary JavaScript that you need, but we don't ship it all to the browser all at once. Because shipping it all to the browser at once and re-executing it all at once is what kind of kills the performance. And so this is kind of a graph that kind of shows that the more JavaScript you ship, these two graphs, the left and right, show one on the left shows the, the, the Lighthouse score, and the one on the right shows the amount of JavaScript that you ship. And what you see is that it's an inverse of each other, right? So the more JavaScript you ship, the, the worse your score is. The, better, the less JavaScript you ship, the better your score is. Did I say that right? You know what I meant. OK, so why, is the, why do we ship all this JavaScript? And that's because we have this thing called hydration. And so the way it works is that we send HTML, and there is a blank page. This is how the websites used to work. And so then in the blank page, there's a script tag to load the JavaScript, which then in turn executes the application, which in turn renders the application, which shows you the UI. And this is when you can click on a UI, and so voila, you have your application. The problem is that you will get to look at this white screen for a long time. And people wanted to fix this. So we started to do server-side pre-rendering. What it means is that we, on a server, we execute the application. And now the HTML we send is much bigger. As you can see, it's a, it's a bigger chunk because it's not a white screen. It's you know, the actual content is in there. And then we see the application. And so it appears faster. And that certainly has improved a lot. But you can't click on it because inside of that uh, HTML is the same JavaScript, which executes the same application, which does the same exact rendering, except now we call it reconciliation instead of render because you know, we have to have a fancy name. Now, it, it, to, to be fair, the reconciliation does try to reuse the HTML nodes, but if they are not there, reconciliation will usually recreate them anyways. And so it's only at this point that you can go and interact with it, and so we're actually slower. Right? The fact that we have SSR actually kind of slows things down because we actually made browser to do more work. And so if you think about it, there's duplicate information, right? If you look at the string like visually build your text stack, that string is found twice, once in the HTML and once in JavaScript. And so there's a whole bunch of duplication that's happening. And so can we do better? 
And the question is, why do we have to do this? And the answer is because we have this thing, we, the hydration is really looking for the listeners. And the way it works is you start at the root of the application, and then you recursively kind of walk the tree, and you find the listeners. Notice some parts of the tree are actually inert. They're, they're static. There's no listeners attached to them. But nevertheless, hydration doesn't know that, and so it has to go and visit everything, which means all of those nodes that are currently on the page or rather components that are currently on a page, all of those components have to be downloaded and executed uh, just to find out whether there's something in it or not. But also, these components create other things. They create the state of the framework. They'll tell the framework where the uh, component boundaries are, and so on and so forth. So the key thing to hydration is that uh, hydration requires the execution of the component before the click works, before that component can become interactive, right? So you can't click on anything until hydration executes. You have to execute uh, the component first, the application code, and only then you can click on it. And then we said, you know, there, there's, there's a lot of it, so let's try to improve the situation. So there's partial hydration, which is popularized by Astro. And so what you do is you kind of break this into islands, right? And each island basically has its own root, and now you can say, like, well, I don't need to hydrate the one in the middle, and maybe I can delay hydrate the other ones. But now you have a new problem, and that is, while in here you had a common root, because you had a common root, you could have passed information between each other. You could have passed state information between components. And now, when you break it into islands, you cannot pass information uh, state between islands. You can, but it's not something that the framework helps you with, right? All of a sudden, it's a different syntax, different API, different way to solve the problem. You cannot rely on a normal way of, of using set state or whatever your favorite framework's way of doing it is. And so then we have React Server Components. And React Server Components basically tries to solve the problem saying, like, look, how about we have islands, but we do the, the common root on a server. And so then because we have a common root, we can actually pass state information between these uh, islands. And so you know, it's, it's a better kind of user experience uh, for it. But in each of these cases, the developer needs to basically do extra work to kind of break up the application into smaller chunks. OK, so let me show you resumability. And let me just show you how it's different. So resumability basically starts the same way. You start with HTML. And uh, the HTML contains the page, so so far so good. But inside of this HTML is teeny tiny JavaScript, about one kilobyte big, that executes super fast. And all of a sudden, that JavaScript makes it so you can immediately click on a, a button. And um, you know, so it's actually faster. But then where is the JavaScript? So the JavaScript is eagerly downloaded, right? And notice that it's smaller. You know, it's not as big as it was before. What happened? Where is the other missing pieces? You know? uh, and the answer is, well, we removed a whole bunch of duplicate work. A whole bunch of duplicate stuff got removed. Really, the JavaScript only now contains the interactive bits, not the bits for like building the whole application. Um, and so because of that, we don't have to execute the, uh, the application or reconcile the application. As a matter of fact, because all these bits are now missing, it is impossible to execute the application end-to-end -end because, well, most of the application was never actually downloaded. And so this is what resumability is. And the way you to think about it is that you take that graph and you flip it upside down. Previously, we started at the root and we walked towards the children to find the listeners, right? These arrows on the listeners, if you go, well, it's going to be a lot. Notice, the arrows point toward the red boxes. But in resumability, the arrows point the other way around, from the, from the red boxes to the component. So resumability basically allows you to enter the system not at the root of the component and then traverse everywhere, but really enter the system at the event level, and then the events pull in all the required bits. So you kind of flip the problem upside down. And so this famous guy basically said premature, uh, premature optimization is the root of all evil. And so you should ask yourself why. And the answer to that is, well, because when you're optimizing, what you're really trading is a clean code, which is simple code, for fast code, but it's complicated code, right? And we really write code not for the computer. We write it for other humans. And so what we want to do is we want to write like simple code and somehow have the compiler kind of do the optimization for us so that we don't have to do that, right? So we want to build an application and then typically what happens, we realize the application is slow and then we try to somehow optimize it. 
And maybe, you know, some of us don't do the step number three. And this is the state we are currently in, that most of the applications are actually in a pretty bad shape that, that are on the web. And so what if I told you that if, you, if, uh, if, I, if, you, if I gave you two new primitives, one is signals and one is what we call code extraction, which is this dollar sign, if I could give you those two primitives, then a compiler could be written that can optimize the application automatically. Wouldn't that be nice? You could continue writing simple code. You wouldn't have to uh, worry about like, how do I optimize things? How do I make it more complicated? You could just write simple code that's easy to understand. And the compiler can do the, the tricks, such as you know, the O1 startup, we'll talk about it in a sec, lazy loading and lazy execution of everything so that your application can have a good startup performance no matter how much JavaScript you kind of write to it. Wouldn't that be nice? So that's kind of what Quick is, right? So you can get the, the developer experience that you're used to, but the computer can do the hard work of figuring out how to ship all of this thing for you. So, demo time, right? That's uh, uh, a picture's worth a thousand words, a demo's worth a thousand uh, picture slides. All right, um, so let's do a very simple uh, component. So let me show you, how's the font? Is the font, let's make the font bigger. How's that? Yes, okay. So here we have a very simple component. Uh, notice, I'm gonna, print out console log render uh, to the screen. And notice that the, the text shows up over here. That's because we're doing server-side rendering, right? That in itself is not surprising. If you did this in React, you would have the same exact res uh, result. As a matter of fact, if you did it in any uh, server-side render framework, you would see the console log on a server. Now, the thing you would expect to see on the client is, you know, here's your code. If I refresh this, you would also expect to see that in the client, because on the client, you have to run hydration, right? So hydration would start at the root. You would visit all of the components. And as you're vi visiting all the components, the console log should print. But in this particular case, the console log doesn't print. Well, it's actually even crazier. If, um, if you go to the, the network tab, and I'm looking at JavaScript here, there's actually no JavaScript. Uh, now, I know what you're thinking. Like, this is a trivial component, like it's not that interesting. Now, I did filter out Vite, just to kind of be clear. And Vite, uh, it, because I'm running in dev mode, Vite is like, does hot module reloading, and so it ships a little bit of JavaScript, but I'm gonna pretend it's not there because in production, Vite disappears. So, you know, that's not really that interesting. Let's make a, another component. So let's make uh, a component called hello. And this component, let's make it a button. And let's add some interactivity on it. Uh, wow, OK. Almost, almost got me. And let's format this better. Whoa. OK, so here we have a component that has hello. Now, clearly, and let's, let's uh, do console log here. Clearly, we should print. Uh, you can see that it says hello over here. You, we should print the hello world on, a sir, on the client, right? Uh, we can now interact with it. But notice, no hello world. So does it work? Can I click on it? It does. I click on it, and the right thing happens. So notice, again, what happened to JavaScript. No JavaScript. I click. JavaScript shows up. So we can go and say, hmm, well, what exactly is the uh, response here? Notice that the response here is literally just console.log and nothing else. The system looked at this. It said, you know, I have multiple components. I have this component, and I have a child component, and I might have to run them. And the system kind of looked at it and said, you know what? None of this stuff is important. Really, the only thing we need is just the listener, just a click listener, nothing else. And this is what I mean by this diagram that I had earlier th that the entry points are reversed, right? Here. The red boxes represent the listeners, and so we are entering on the red box, and then the red box may or may not pull in a component, depending on whether it needs to. So now clicking on this particular button will do the, perform the operation, but nothing happens. And so how does this work? Well, you see this dollar sign? That, this is code extraction, right? What, what is happening is that the uh, system, the dollar sign tells the system to basically do something like this. Uh, const. Right? We are exporting it as a top-level export, 
And because we're exporting it as a top-level export, it is possible for the browser to import it when you click it. If it is in this format, which is buried in here, the only way to get a hold of that particular component is to go and uh, execute the component. Actually, let me actually remove the export here. Uh, now I can't even get a hold of the hello, which means now the framework has to get hold of this component, which in turn returns this component, which in turn returns some JSX, which contains the listener, right? So the listener is buried deep down. And instead, with this dollar sign, what we're allowed to do is we basically create uh, code extraction. We extract the code to a top level so that we can import it and we can begin execution of the application at that location. So how does it know to do that? Well, if you click on the hello, notice it says on click, and there is a URL that basically says where the system has to go to download the code and make everything work. So this URL basically says, you know, go download that particular JavaScript. Inside of it, you will find a bundle. There is a symbol that's being exported. Execute that symbol. Now, this is dev mode. You, OK, so let me back up a second. So when I click, request happens. And at this point, everybody says, yeah, but doesn't it mean that when you have an application and you click on it, you have to wait for the network? And so if you enter the tunnel, the application stops working? Yes, if it would be like this, the way I'm showing it now, that is exactly what would happen. However. That is not what happens in production. In production, we put the bundles slightly differently. We put several symbols in the same uh, bundle so we don't have uh, uh, waterfalls. And also, we have a uh, uh, service worker that eagerly starts downloading the JavaScript as soon as you navigate to the website. So let me show you that. Uh, we are at this website. Let's go. Uh, application. OK, I want to look at the cache. Cache is empty. There is nothing in the cache. The moment I navigate to a uh, website, and do I have a network? I do have a network. Notice, cache was immediately created and populated with all the related code. So now, even though I go and interact with the page, and I click on a particular thing, notice for the response it says a service worker. So even if I go and interact with the page, all of the responses are instantaneous because the service worker already fetched all of the required code. So in production, we will eagerly download the JavaScript, not the whole application. Remember, a lot of the part of the applications was determined to be static. Uh, just the relevant bits, and it's in the service worker, so you experience no delay. OK, let's do a more complicated example. So if you think about this extraction, uh, let's make it harder by having a counter. So let's create a new component. Ah, no, really, I can type. You know, it is so hard to type when people are watching you. Like, I type without any mistakes, really. And then the moment people are watching you, you can't type. Do you have the same experience? Uh, Console.log. OK, so no, you sure? Yeah. So now let's create uh, a state. And let's create a state of one, two, three, and then say, count uh, no 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 <laughs> this one now really typing is so hard when people are watching okay uh, on I almost typed ng click look at that All right. Oh. And why are you not enough parentheses? OK. So now we have our button that knows how to click. So you have our counter, and we can do plus one. And again, notice no JavaScript shows up until I click on it. Now, the, when the counter rendered on a server, it says render counter. So will it have to print render counter on a client? Notice it still doesn't print render co uh, counter. And if you look at what's being downloaded, well, we're downloading just the button that knows how to do count value plus plus. And the framework obviously has to show up. And then there's some stuff for the build system. But nothing else shows up. And this is interesting because how did the system actually know that this count needs to go and update this piece of DOM? 
you know, normally the system would get this information by executing the component. But as, as I'm showing you, the component did not execute on the client because of this. So this is kind of the magic of signals. And signals, uh, in Quick, they can be one of two ways. A signal when uh, is connected either to a component, in which case the component has to re-render and download and do all this stuff, or it can be connected directly to the DOM. And when it's connected directly to the DOM, uh, there is no need for a component because you know, changing the value, you just know exactly which DOM element to change. So how does this actually work? So when you have a, when the, the thing to point out is that in this case, the, the listener closes over a count, right? Which means if I go and extract this code to a top level function such as this, it doesn't work because it says, hey, I don't know what a count is. Right? And so how does, how does the extraction actually work? Well, the extraction works because if you click on it and you go to the network tab, you'll see that we inserted a piece of code that recovers the state of the system. And this recovering of the state is really what reasonability is all about. It allows the, because without this, you would have to execute the component in order to figure out what the initial state is. But because we can recover that information through reasonability, the component never has to execute. And you can just execute the counter. And so the way it kind of works in, in production is that you have, again, here's your URL. And notice that in this time, there is a bracket zero. This basically says you're going to have to recover some system, uh, some information. And so in, in our case, uh, we are serializing the state. And as you can see, the state one, two, three is serialized over here. In addition, we serialize the subscriptions, and in this says that uh, this particular subscription is attached to number nine. And number nine, if you go here, notice there's a comment that says number nine is the, the value one, two, four. And so the framework knows that if you go and click over here, I just have to go update that component, and there is no need to even download the component. Sorry, I have to uh, go update the DOM element, and there's no need to do any of that. OK, let's go more complicated. Let's bring in clock. And it's going to import from the wrong location because it always does that. Mm, yes, that's wrong. OK. Clock. OK. So here's our clock. And notice it updates every one second, right? And so let's have a look at how it's implemented. So a clock, well, a clock is just a component. Notice it says again, render clock. And notice again that in the console, no render clock is happening in the client. So somehow, this component, this clock is being updated even though the component isn't actually running. So what do we do here? We bring some styles. We declare the state of the system, uh, which you know, has the, the angles of hour, minute, and second. And we have a visible task, which uh, basically goes and updates uh, the, the, the angles based on the current time, and we go and call it every one second to kind of update it, right? And so then we have some DOM associated with it that sets the rotations of all the different um, hands on the clock face, right? And so it works. And again, if you notice over here, what we downloaded is we downloaded a piece of code that has to execute eagerly on the client. In this particular case, we had to uh, download you know, the set interval. The framework showed up and nothing else. And again, if I refresh, you can see that now the code is eagerly showing up to the client. Well, because it has to, right? That's the only way to do it. But let's do something fun. Let's create a div and let's create a style. And in this style, we say height. And 100 BH. Let me see if I get this right. Oh, look, now the clock is below the fold. What happened to JavaScript? The JavaScript disappeared. No more JavaScript. Let's scroll the clock into the view, see what happens. When I scroll it in, look at that. JavaScript shows up and starts executing again. And so from the view point of view of the user, uh, the right stuff is happening. And so Quick has this interesting property that uh, you explain your intent in a way that's extremely familiar to React developers. How many React developers up here? So this is dev mode. In dev mode, service worker doesn't do anything. In the, in the production mode, the service worker would eagerly start downloading the, the JavaScript. 
even though it's not visible, it will download it. Even though you didn't click on it or didn't interact with the app, you will soon. And so all the this, uh, related code is downloaded eagerly in the service worker. And then um, you know, the code doesn't execute. So there's a distinction between downloading code into the cache and then loading the code into the V8, into the VM, right? So we don't download the code into the V8, but we do eagerly load it inside the cache in production only. So if you play around in the dev mode, none of this stuff is happening in dev mode because part of it is that we're running inside of the Vite. Um, okay, uh, where was I? So I basically showed you kind of these demos. And I think these demos are kind of interesting because you can do uh, interesting bits that you can't do normally. So let's go back to our clock example here and let's make another uh, uh, component called, um, let's call it an expensive component. And let's go to the bottom and create a uh, component. Oops. Come on. I can type, really. Here we go. OK. So now we have our uh, expensive component. So let's create a button in here. Uh, and then let's have it on click. And let's pretend that this log that says expensive is expensive, right? Now, expensive in which way? There's two kinds of expensive, right? There could be, it could be expensive in a sense of um, uh, download, right? We don't want to download, so if I click on it, notice it, it immediately uh, prints click and expensive, so they're both being downloaded together. And so maybe we want to lazy load the expensive part. Uh, and now I'm just kind of realizing that I should have done it with a counter. So actually, I apologize. Let me move it over to the button to the counter, uh, like here. And the thing I want to show is that how about we want to execute the expensive part only if the count value uh, is even, right? OK, so let's say we want to uh, do it only even. So if I hit expensive, no, nope. uh, value percent zero equals zero. Is that what it is? 123 expensive. OK, so now expensive doesn't print because it's not even, right? If I hit plus one and now click it, now it will print. Now if I hit plus one, it won't, right? So the thing is, uh, the expensive doesn't print, but nevertheless, I have downloaded it, right? If I go to the JavaScript, I see it over here. You can see it in the source code that um, it is being downloaded. Come on, let me make this thing somehow viewable. Okay, you can see that it's, it's in here. So let's say I want to lazy load this. So the way we do, do this lazy loading is we would simply say, uh, we would take this piece of code and we would say const uh, expensive function is equal to dollar sign and we put the Put, the, put it in as a uh, expensive function. And uh, okay, import, import. There's a bug in VS Code that doesn't import things that are dollar signs for some reason. You have to manually do so. Um, okay, so now we have an expensive function. And then, of course, we will call the expensive function only sometimes, right? So just by wrapping in a dollar sign, I now have an interesting property. Notice that if I click expensive, it says click, but if you look at the code, you'll see that the console log expensive is not present. It is, it's been removed. Um, and now if I do plus one and hit expensive, it's only then that the expensive code downloaded. So to get lazy loading working inside of Quick, all you have to do is wrap something in a dollar sign. That's kind of cool, right? Because if you think about your existing application and say, hey, uh, how do I get lazy loading going in my ex existing application? It's a quite a lot of work. You have to go and you have to refactor things and you have to move things around, etc. But in this case, I can do even something cooler. I can directly print the value of the count. So this count uh, needs to be captured, right? It's a variable that's being captured and it correctly displays the value even though it's lazy loaded. And so this is a common problem when you lazy load is that the lazy loaded code doesn't have access to the same state and so now you somehow have to pass the state over to the lazy loaded code. Uh, 
The other problem with lazy loading in, other, in frameworks is that frameworks insist on being synchronous. And it's really difficult to insert asynchronous boundaries into the framework. But the nice thing about Quick is that you can actually put async anywhere you want. And because you can put async anywhere you want, you can, uh, you can basically just uh, await anywhere you want. And so the, the fact that something becomes asynchronous is actually not a problem. And of course, uh, you know, the service worker will prefetch this code eagerly so that it's available for you to execute whenever you want. But what if it, the expensive means the other kind of expensive, which is what if it's expensive to execute and we don't want to keep the, uh, uh, the, the client busy for a while? What if I change this from dollar sign to simply server dollar sign? Now, if I hit plus one and hit expensive, the click shows up on a client, but the expensive bit all of a sudden shows up on a server. Now, isn't that nice? Oh, you like that. OK. Thank you. That, I think, is mind-blowing. But it, it's, it's a really nice example. Uh, and notice the server actually gets a hold of the closed-over value. So the fact that you have a value on the client and the server just kind of gets a hold of it uh, works just fine. And you can do other crazy things. You can, for example, in here, you can return a, uh, uh, another function, uh, yes, actually, response. You can return a response function if you like. And this response then becomes available here. Right? And we can execute it. And so now, if I get correct number of parentheses, if you hit expensive, notice that the click executes on the client, the actual expensive bit is on a server, and then the server returns a function to the client, which then the client executes. And so server can actually choose to return polymorphic stuff, right? It can the, the, the return different function at different time. And actually, the server can also return JSX values or a component or anything else that you want. And so anything that's serializable within the realms of Quick uh, can be returned. I can move basically between server and the client as you want. How am I doing on time? OK, so let me show you one more thing, and then we can go over to questions. Uh, let's see if I remember this correctly. So there's a new URL here, uh, localhost. So oftentimes, we talk about this idea uh, that Quick is, is streaming. And so let me show you what, what I mean by that. Um, here is a page that is you know, blank, has no JavaScript in it. And I'm going to start scrolling the page. And notice that I just, as I start scrolling, more and more JavaScript shows up, right? And these, as you can see, are interactive. That's why you see the behavior. And the, the thing to show you, right, let me just do it again. No JavaScript, right? And as you are scrolling, which is a common behavior, you know, code just shows up and code gets executed on an as needed basis. And this is what we mean by streaming is that instead of overwhelming the browser all at once at the beginning with hydration and say, bang, here's everything. Can we do it automatically where you have a framework where your mental model is the same that you've always had? You read components that compose as you've always done, but has this nice streaming capability that as you're using the application, the code just shows up on an as needed basis. And again, just want to reiterate, there is a service worker that will all do the, all the prefetching. So even on slow, unreliable network, uh, things will be fine. So that's the main thing. Um, I think I'm gonna, we're going to do some questions. Yes? Thank you. That was uh, a really cool demo. Actually, we might take the Q&A there, because if some of the questions may... Yeah, some of them might do a demo. Yeah, yeah. So let's do it here. Exactly. Cool. Um, well, uh, the first one doesn't, but this is an interesting question. Uh, quick sounds near perfect. So that was a compliment. Uh, question is, what's the catch? Um, so yeah, a lot of people ask that question, what's the catch? Uh, so first of all, Quick is meant to be a general purpose framework. So whatever you can build with your existing framework, whether it's React, Quick, uh, Angular, uh, Solid, or you know, whatever framework you happen to love, should be the same exact thing you can build in, in Quick. So what is the catch? Well, 
Uh, there are a couple of things. Just like when React came in and said, hey, we're going to use, use methods, there are specific rules you have to follow, right? And so you had to learn those rules. And that for a while, there was a time when you had to learn new things. And so after a while, though, when you use the use methods, you, it kind of becomes second nature. You don't even question it. It's just natural, right? And so Quick has the use methods. Um, but it also has signals, and signals also has a learning curve. You have to learn new things. Uh, I believe that after you use signals in a while, it just becomes second nature, and it, you don't even think about it. And the last thing you have to learn in Quick is you have to understand the dollar sign, right? You have to understand what's happening, and specifically, the dollar sign has rules about it, just like all the other technologies. And these rules are around what an is and isn't serializable. Uh, so, so Quick can serialize just about everything that commonly you use in your system, uh, but certain things cannot be serialized, right? Like, for example, if you create a uh, class and you create an instance of a class, so, you know, how would you serialize the thing? That, that's not a thing that we can do. So you have to stick to regular data for serialization. Um, now, if it's not really that big of a constraint because if you think about it, if you're using Next.js, Next.js is already doing that. When you do get server props, right, get static props, you're already serializing it into the next underscore data object. And that also is already JSON. And now in our case, we can not only serialize the JSON stuff, we can serialize things like uh, promises, sets, maps, uh, JSX, VDOM, right? Uh, and of course, closures is the big thing we know how to serialize. So we can serialize a lot of things in JavaScript just out of the box without you having to think about it. But yes, there are certain things that we will never be able to serialize. But I don't think that's a, such a big deal because you already kind of have those constraints already in your existing frameworks anyways. Nice. Um, can you show a loading state while the code is being downloaded? Uh, this is one of the uh, requests that we uh, need to implement. Uh, the idea would be that when you are when the code when you click on something, we add a class, so no JavaScript is required, and then you just have to style the system in the correct way that when the class is present, you show the loading spinner, and then when the thing is removed, it, it's going to be gone. Um, again, the service worker's job is to make sure that all the code is prefetched, so that when you do have a click on something, uh, there should really be no no delay in uh, in the UI. Um, I think there's a question I'm, I'm, I'm losing. Oh, so Quick City uh, seems all batteries included, like use resource yes. forms and more. Um, we haven't really defined, I guess, Quick City for the yeah, audience. So, let's talk so what about is that. that and also what is missing? So Quick is like React and Quick City is like Next.js or you know, Solid and Solid Start or Svelte and Svelte Kit or Vue and Nuxt or you know, whatever the meta framework happens to be. The way to think about it is uh, Quick is all about the component itself, right? Anything you do in a component, you, you work with Quick. Uh, Quick City is all about the stuff that happens around the component. That includes routing, which I actually didn't show you that much, uh, routing, fetching data, uh, doing actions, um, middleware, defining endpoints, uh, basically everything that you need uh, for a server-related things. Uh, is included in Quick City. And also, you know, what I showed you earlier about the server dollar sign, which allowed you to kind of teleport functions from client back to the server. Nice. All right. Uh, we only have time for one more question. There's actually plenty for you. Uh, but it's been my experience that if you ask Mishko any questions about Quick, he will tell you a lot about Quick. So yes. uh, please do uh, uh, ask him on the after party. And I have stickers to give out for yes. questions. Uh, so what is the current state of adoption? Like, are any sort of like big products or companies, have they adopted Quick? Are they going yeah, to? Yeah. So, so we have, um, internally, we have a private chat set up with uh, several companies that are currently trying to get it to production. Uh, we have Rosa, which actually was already in production. It's a uh, medical company, not medical company, a booking company which allows you to book appointments with your doctors inside of Belgium. Uh, we have, uh, there's a German company called Sports Time, which is kind of like Decathlon of, of Germany, apparently. Uh, and they're rebuilding their system in, in, um, in it as well. And there's lots of smaller companies. But we have, you know, lots of internal private channels where we kind of set up one-on-one -on -one and help companies get started on this stuff. So what I'm hearing is that if there's any name brand companies who want to get their logo yes. on the Quick uh, website, yes. there is We will give you special attention. Yes, yes. All right, everyone, thanks. Uh, one more time for Mishko. Thank you.